Okay, so we have seen how uh, you know orthogonal polynomials lead to this vector space structure and some immediate consequences. So in this lecture, we will uh, start looking at some uh, you know very general uh, looking at a very general approach to construct such orthogonal polynomials. And so this general framework will come in handy when we look at you know many classes of such orthogonal polynomials. Okay, so we have seen how you know we are looking at a bunch of polynomials C0, C1, C2 of uh, successively increasing degree and there is a weight function W of x and an interval A to B specified and they are orthogonal, right? So the orthogonality is given by this relation whenever n is not equal to n. Now this orthogonality of these polynomials we have seen immediately implies that every such polynomial is orthogonal to any polynomial of degree n minus 1 or less uh, and specifically uh, in fact cn of x is orthogonal to every x to the p whenever p is less than n right so this relation holds now so if we want to construct a, a polynomial a set of polynomials like this we have to design this set in such a way that this relation holds this is a you know key relation right so one way to try to do this is to construct you know these uh, this products such product cn of x times w of x to be you know the nth derivative of a function right suppose you do this then what would happen so we would have uh, you know we can invoke the uh, integration by parts so we have you know this object is written as the nth derivative of this function and so then what what would we do so we would say so this is like u dv well i mean this is u and this is dv so that can be written as uh, uv so in this case it will be x to the p times d n n minus 1 uh, divided by dx n minus 1 xn between uh, you know a and b so that those are you know values you have to input and just evaluate the function at that point minus the derivative of this quantity p times x to the p minus 1 and then it's just as it is cn of x times w of x that will be just this guy oh so it's uh, uv minus v uh, v du so this is u so that's right so um, so it, it's going to be d to the n minus 1 by dx minus 1 right so this is something you have to convince yourself by you know spending a few minutes and putting it on down on paper so the idea is um, okay let's see so we have something like uh, d to the n uh, d to the n uh, by dx to the n by dx to the n uh, and this function on the left side is x to the p so we have something like this x to the p uh, dx so this is the integral that we are doing so when you do this so this is like this is u and this is v so this is yeah so this is u dv so this we write it as x to the p into d to the n minus 1 x well xn by dx to the n minus 1 evaluated at a and at b minus integral now it's an integral a to the a to b now we have to take a derivative of this guy so it's going to be p times x to the p minus 1 and then we have to work with d to the n minus 1 xn by d x to the n minus 1 dx but then again we can apply integration by parts to this new quantity which in turn will you know now there's a p sitting here and the next time there's going to be a p times p minus 1 then a p minus p times p minus 1 times p minus 2 so on so in the end we will and also there are you know signs which keep changing alternating every time so you can convince yourself that in, indeed uh, what this boils down to is you know just this big big sum right so there is a n minus 1 derivative of xn times x to the p minus p times the n minus 2th derivative of xn times x to the p minus 1 
plus so on all the way up to p factorial times minus 1 to the p. So these signs keep alternating and then you get a p factorial in the end. So first time is minus p then you get a plus p into p minus 1 and so on. And finally you have n, the, the derivative that you have to take here is of the order n minus p minus 1 x, xn and uh, you want this evaluated at d minus evaluated at a must go to 0. Right. So if you can somehow arrange for this, then this would work out. Right. So for simplicity, a general way to arrange this is to actually just demand that all these derivatives are 0 at both the points, at a and at b, separately. So if you demand each of these quantities is, is 0, both at a and at b, then this gets automatically satisfied. Right. So that's what we will do. So suppose we make this as a condition that all these derivatives q equal to 0, q equal to 1, all the way up to n minus 1, uh, they just simply vanish at both a and at b and automatically, you know, what we are looking for is satisfied. Right, so that's, that's the approach we are going to take and it's going to, this is one way to construct a set of functions. At this point, you know, we are looking at a bunch of functions, c n of x, such that they are orthogonal to x to the p, where p is less than n right so we have seen that there are these there are these three special intervals right all intervals can be recast as in one of these three forms and so we would actually choose xn to take this particular form it's convenient to write it as xn is equal to s to the n times fn of x break xn itself is a product of two functions x s to the n times fn of x now this s is what is going to you know nicely take care of these end points right so if if uh, a and b are taken to be minus 1 and plus 1 you choose s of x to be x squared minus 1 so x plus 1 times x minus 1 so at both these ends this object is going to go to 0 and in fact you take it to the power n so that you know all these higher order derivatives also go to 0 at, at both the end points and if with only a finite which then gets mapped in turn to 0 to infinity, you take s of x to be x. Now, you, since you have x to the n, you know, you can take derivatives of this and still when you put x equal to 0, there is going to be some power of x lingering around. So, it's going to kill this function at the point uh, x equal to 0. But on the other hand, when you, the other limit uh, plus infinity, the way to ensure that it falls off to 0 and all higher order derivatives fall off to 0 is to make sure that this fn of x is going to die sufficiently quickly as x tends to infinity. And the third case is when s of x has no role, you just put s of x to be 1, it's entirely in the hands of fn to ensure convergence and so fn of x must die down sufficiently quickly at both ends. Right? So these are the three scenarios we will consider and so if we you know, plug this in and build the sequence of functions, cn of x is equal to 1 over w of x nth derivative of s to the power n of x times fn of x, this is going to satisfy the condition that we want, namely the orthogonality property between these functions, the sequence of functions with respect to x to the p, where p is any integer positive or non-negative integer less than n. Right? So this is basically we are in the right direction. But at this point, these c n of x are just some functions. We want to, if we can somehow ensure that these functions are also polynomials, then we would have come up with a prescription to uh, you know, generate such polynomials. Right, so it turns out that, you know, a way to make these orthogonal functions, uh, you know, to, to become po polynomials is to actually choose these uh, weight function itself as this function fn of x right so we have at this point it's completely general fn of x simply has to have certain nice properties far away right at, at, at the two ends uh, but suppose you choose fn of x to be this weight function and then it turns out right so this is something it's kind of a trial and error approach and then it it, it so happens that we can actually show that if we choose these fn of x themselves to be w of x and demand certain properties of these w of x's, then we can generate a bunch of polynomials. So let's look at 
you know, some of the conditions that, uh, you know, will have to be satisfied. We'll sort of state them, but in, in the following lecture and, and uh, you know, as we go along, we look at, you know, some of the details of this. At this point, we're sort of just stating how, the, what are the broad conditions which we need to put in, right? So first of all, we must choose W of X to be finite and infinitely differentiable within A and B, right? So W of X should be a really nice function because, and it's also infinitely differentiable because after all, all these polynomials are defined in terms of these nth order derivatives. So you have to be, uh, you know, W of X must be sufficiently smooth that you keep on differentiating it repeatedly and you should get into no trouble, right? So first of all, W of X is finite and infinitely differentiable with, within this entire region of interest A to B. Also at the boundaries, so W of A times S of A must go to zero and at W of B times uh, S of B must go to zero. And in the case of, uh, you know, either A or B or both of them being uh, infinite, then this uh, W of X times S of X has to die down sufficiently rapidly. It should in fact go down faster than any power of one over X whenever A and, and or, or B R plus or minus infinity, right? So this ensures convergence of these you know, various integrals involved. And in fact, um, a requirement, you know, an immediate consequence in fact of these conditions is that these weight functions are, you know, such that this integral A to B W of X DX is, is going to be finite, right? So it's your, your weight function cannot be some, um, uh, some arbitrary function. It not only is it non-negative, but there is this interpretation of this uh, weight function as a kind of measure, right? So it all adds up to some finite value, right? So that's uh, sort of inbuilt in these conditions. And another, uh, it turns out, right? So this we will see, we'll explore further some of these properties in the next lecture and, so, and following lectures, is if you choose the first of these, C1 of X, to be a linear polynomial, then automatically with these conditions, you can actually get all the following functions in this sequence to be also polynomials. We will just have to ensure that the first one is a polynomial and that will actually give us a differential equation. So you work out this differential equation, solve for it, and then for a given S of X, W of X, you've chosen it in a nice way, it's going to lead to the first polynomial, you force it to be a, a, a polynomial, a linear polynomial in X, and that will automatically give you a whole sequence of polynomials. That's going to be this orthogonal set of polynomials. And we will see by playing with these weight functions and these intervals and these S's, we can actually generate many classes of polynomials, which many of which actually we're already sort of familiar with, but it's, uh, it's interesting that we have this sort of very general perspective from which we will come to the, from, from the general to the particular, right? So that's the philosophy that we are adopting. Okay, so that's all for this lecture. But before we go off, I just want to very quickly mention um, that there are these very interesting scaling properties, which we will also exploit, right? One is that CN of X is unaffected by a scaling of W of X, right? So CN of X is defined like this. So if you multiply w of x by some factor since it's going to get divided here cn of x is unchanged if you scale w of x by an arbitrary positive factor positive factor because after all w of x has to be a non-negative uh, function and again we can also check that the orthogonality property is unaffected by scaling s of x right so the orthogonality property uh, you know comes way back here so this is something that you can, you can check, right? So uh, S of X comes here. If you scale S of X, you will still get uh, a bunch of you know, orthogonal functions. So the orthogonality property is unaffected by scaling S of X. So this is also something that you should, you should check explicitly and convince yourself that this holds, right? So these properties will turn out to be useful in our future discussion. Okay, that's all for this lecture. Thank you.